Uh, first of all, big thank you to Steve and the SESC group for inviting me along today, and thank you to all of you for coming along to this uh, first event, the first Red Team Thursday event. Um, my name's Andy. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my presentation first. You're probably wondering why I'm here, because I'm clearly from the blue team and not from the red team. Um, but hopefully there's going to be some interesting things that you'll find out from the work that we do in Instant Response. Uh, so the presentation is basically going to be uh, talking about three real incidents that we responded to for our customers. And we're going to talk about sort of how the attacker got onto the network in the first place, how they moved around the network, how they uh, accomplished their goals, basically whatever they were trying to do. Um, and then we're going to talk, it's all well and good hearing war stories from people, um, but I think the important thing is if we give recommendations on uh, sort of how people can prevent these attacks from happening. So we're going to step through each phase of the attack and look and see what controls we can put in place to prevent each phase from being successful. A little bit about me before we get started in the kind of main part of the presentation. Um, so I'm head of instant response at BA Systems. Um, I joined in 2016. Um, before that, I worked in IT infrastructure. Um, so I've been doing sort of IT and security for just over 20 years now. Um, a lot of experience with Windows, Linux systems, network uh, infrastructure, um, all that kind of stuff, which is really useful when you're doing instant response work because you can use those skills to sort of identify where there's gaps in security and where people can fix those problems. Uh, in terms of what we do at BA Systems, um, the Instant Response team have a group of customers who we basically help when something bad happens to them. Um, we've got customers in all sorts of different sectors. We've got customers in transport, banking, uh, telco sectors, legal, finance, the whole, the whole shebang really. Um, so it's a really interesting place to work because you've got a, a wide variety of different customers. They've all got different networks, they've all got different problems, they've got different uh, things that they're trying to protect from the bad guys. And the bad guys are obviously trying to target them all the time as well. Right, I'm just going to touch a little bit on um, different types of attackers. Um, so on the left-hand side we've got the criminals. Um, so these guys are trying to get into people's computer networks to get cash, essentially. So they might uh, sort of get into a bank and try and transfer some money out of that bank. Uh, they might conduct a ransomware attack um, and sort of hold, hold a company or an organisation to hostage uh, and try and get some cash out of them that way. Um, then we've got uh, activists who are serving a cause, so they want to uh, mainly sort of disrupt um, operations for particular organisations. So they might have a grievance against a particular sector, they might go after them, they might do a, a DDoS attack or they might deface a website, uh, something like that. Um, then we've got the nation state actors. This, I think, well, for, for me at least, is the most interesting group of, uh, group of attackers. They're trying to get into companies or organizations to do espionage and sort of spy on them, see what's going on, uh, get sensitive data out of the organization, basically. <clears throat> and then the last group we've got on the right-hand side are the insiders. Um, and we'll kind of split that up into two. We've got the malicious insiders and the un unintentional uh, insiders. So the malicious ones are people who are out to do something bad. They've, they've thought of maybe they might be leaving the company, for example. And they might want to steal a lot of data on the way out uh, to take with them. Uh, they might have been sort of uh, recruited by someone to steal uh, sensitive information from a company. And then we've got the unintentional ones who are maybe just a little bit silly in the way that they're, they're using their IT systems. They might uh, sort of be emailing things to personal email accounts and just not looking after the, the, uh, the data on the network very, uh, very, very well. In terms of the groups that we're going to focus on for this presentation, we're going to focus on the criminal group and the state actors. Um, and the reason for this is that although the motivations of these groups are different, um, they both use uh, similar techniques and tools um, when they're getting into networks and moving around. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of overlap in the tooling that these, that these two groups use, and that's why we're going to focus on, on those two. Um, in terms of the incidents we're going to talk about, um, the first type of incident we're going to talk about is a phishing incident. Um, so this is where a, uh, a threat actor would email something into the organisation um, and it could be a malicious payload, it could be a credential harvesting site, and they're trying to get uh, a, a tool of some sort or credentials um, out of the, the organisation. The second one we're going to look into is a vulnerable service. 
Um, this is typically things like uh, VPNs or exchange servers that are sitting on the perimeter of the network that are exposed to the internet. Uh, there might be a vulnerability in there that hasn't been patched and attackers can use those vulnerabilities to get into the, into the network and then sort of move around afterwards. And then the final um, attack that we're going to look at is a compromised supplier. Um, this could be, uh, it could be um, an organisation that you might have outsourced your IT to. Um, it could be that using a piece of software that has got a vulnerability in it or has been compromised in some way. And again, these, these, uh, these can be used as routes into the network for attackers. So the first one, the first instance we're going to look at is the, the phishing incident. So we'll break this into two. So there's credential theft and there's malicious payload. These are the two uh, sort of main types that we're going to look at. So credential theft on the left hand side, um, the attacker sends a link into the, into the um, organization to a particular target within the organization, takes them to a fake login page like this, and they're able to harvest the credentials from that user. Um, they can also harvest MFA tokens through here as well. So even if you've got MFA set up, if your users don't realize that there's a horrible looking URL at the top there, um, they can quite easily trick people into putting in the username, putting in the password, and then putting in their two-factor code as well. Malicious payload, um, slightly different. Um, there's a couple of ways that this can work. So one is like the example on the right-hand side here, um, where the attacker emails in um, a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, that's the usual sort of method. Um, that document has macros within it. If the user opens it up, enables macros, that allows the attacker to drop uh, something onto the machine, uh, a payload onto the machine. The other method is slightly uh, different to this, where they would email in a link into the organization. Um, so the email itself doesn't have any malicious content in it. But then when the user clicks on the link, it downloads something from a web server on the internet, and they end up with a payload on the machine that way. So this is the first uh, incident that we're going to look at. So we've got our shady looking attacker sitting up here at the top. Um, so he sends in a phishing email. Um, the phishing email contains a link to an attacker controlled website. So the user, you tell users, oh, don't open up emails, don't click on links from people that you don't know, but everyone ignores that, of course, and goes ahead and does it. Uh, so the user um, opens up the email, clicks on the link within it. That causes a Excel spreadsheet um, to be downloaded onto their computer. Um, the Excel spree ha spreadsheet has a, a macro within it. Of course, the user is obviously going to click the little button to enable macros as well. So they do that, uh, and that causes a small remote access trojan called SDB bot uh, to be downloaded from, uh, from the attacker control server onto their machine. Um, and that small little remote access trojan gets installed on the, machi on the machine. Um, and establishes a command and control channel out to um, another server on the internet. So there's a few different phases to this attack that we can um, put uh, mitigations in place for. So the first one is the, the emails come in. Um, and it doesn't matter how many times you tell users not to click on links and stuff, there's always going to be one person who will do it. So if, unless you're doing like a phishing awareness campaign and you're getting like 0% hits on, on people clicking on links, then it's, it's not going to be a good enough control. So we're really focusing on technical controls here that we can put in place. Um, so the first one is basically configuring your email filtering properly um, and making sure that it's being configured to uh, detect and block um, any malicious emails that are coming in. So a lot of the time, uh, people might sort of lower the filter down a bit um, to allow email, there might be legitimate emails being blocked and they might lower the, the filtering down a bit. Um, so uh, that, that's the kind of first recommendation. You'll see after each of the recommendations, there's a little uh, pair of bolt cutters. Um, these are a little bit like the, um, the chilies that you might see on uh, restaurant menus that uh, the, the chilies tell you how so painful it's going to be the following day. Um, the bolt cutters tell you sort of how painful it's going to be to implement each of these. So this is a this is a one bolt cutter out of three. Second phase of the attack is we've got this malicious Excel file um, being downloaded from the internet. So we can use web filtering, which you might already have in place as well, um, to block downloads from um, unknown or malicious websites. Um, so again, it's, it, it might be a case of sort of tweaking the controls there a bit. So you might have web filtering in place already, but it might not be configured correctly to block um, these uh, the, uh, sort of malicious downloads happening. 
Next recommendation at the bottom here is blocking macro execution in Excel, uh, in all Office products basically. Um, so there's since um, I think it was Office 2016, um, you can configure using group policy to stop macro execution uh, for files that are downloaded from the internet or files that are delivered via email. Um, so this is a really good control to put in place. Um, and Microsoft actually made a change to Office 365 uh, last year to set this as default, but they had to, they had to roll it back, unfortunately. Um, but it's a good control just to stop that execution of, um, of the initial code happening. Next phase of the attack, um, so we've got this remote access Trojan being dropped on the machine. Um, so when that gets dropped onto the machine, well, to, for, it to get, to, for it to get on the machine in the first place, Excel or, or whatever has to download that file from somewhere. So there's code within the macro in Excel to do that initial download. So we can use the Windows Firewall, which is a, a feature built into Windows, um, to stop the Office applications from connecting out to the internet. <coughs> Um, that gets a, a two bulk cutters. It's a little bit tricky to, to configure the firewall and sort of still allow office updates to happen, but it's not, it's not too hard. Um, the next recommendation we've got over here is to implement application allow listing. Um, so there's, there's a couple of things. There's AppLocker, um, which is in um, up to Windows 10, and then Windows 10 and above has Defender Application Guard as well. Um, so you can configure these to stop unknown executables from running on your network. Um, and you'll see from the recommendations, we're trying to give recommendations that don't involve you having to sort of go out and buy new tools and things. It's, it's all stuff that you've probably already got in place on your network uh, that just needs to be sort of tweaked a bit with the configuration. And then the final thing is we've got the, the remote access Trojans installed and then that needs to connect out to the internet to give that command and control channel. Um, so we can use web filtering again to stop the, those connections from going out to, to this uh, this. Um, malicious server on the internet. That gets a one, a one ball cutter. The next one we're going to look at, the next uh, incident we're going to look at is a vulnerable external service. So um, on the left hand side of the slide here we've got a few um, security products that have had quite critical vulnerabilities in them recently, um, which have allowed attackers to do things like bypass authentication or run code on these devices. Um, they've all been patched now, but there's a period of time when the, the, the product's vulnerable and it hasn't been patched. So this is one way that a service can be, can be vulnerable, uh, by sort of an unpatched vulnerability. Second uh, sort of reason why it might be vulnerable is that it hasn't been configured properly. So it might not have been configured using best practices from the, the vendor. Um, so the vendors normally have um, a set of best practices for, that you can follow for security uh, purposes um, and that will allow the device or, or service to be configured securely. Um, it could be that a configura configuration error has been made um, which reduces security in some way. So what we see quite often here is that there's a problem going on, maybe the, there's a VPN appliance and there's some kind of performance problem going on. Um, so uh, they might make some configuration change to be able to troubleshoot that uh, and then forget to put it back afterwards. And if those configuration errors are made that reduce the security in some way, that could allow an attacker to get into the, into the service. And then the final point on here is unneeded services enabled. So if you've bought, bought a box which you're only using for VPN, but you've got all these other functionalities enabled on it, then it's probably best to just to turn off those features that you're not using um, because you're just increasing the attack surface and making it easier for someone to potentially get in there. And then the final thing um, that can make an external service vulnerable is basically your authentic authentication on it. Um, so it could be that uh, you've got weak password configured on that, weak passwords configured, the, I've got a password complexity policy set. Uh, you might not have multi-factor authentication enabled. Um, or if it is enabled, it might not be enforced. Um, so the user might be able to sort of bypass the requirement for putting in their, their token code. Um, and it's also possible in a lot of cases to bypass MFA. Um, so if you're using things like U2F tokens, they're, they're pretty hard to bypass. But if you're using something that generates a code that you put in, it's possible for an attacker to get their hands on that code because it, it involves a human sort of typing it in. So this is our, this is our incident uh, that we're going to look at. So we've got our, it's a different attacker, he's got the, the same hoodie on, but it's a, a different guy, this one. 
Um, so he, he's sitting at home in his, in his basement somewhere. Um, and then on the right hand side we've got the, the corporate network and unfortunately we've got on the corporate network we've got this vulnerable VPN appliance which hasn't been patched. Um, so the, the vulnerability that I've chosen here, um, it's, it's a few years old but it's a really good one um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a second why it's, why it's such a good one. Um, the organisation's also configured uh, the authentication to be uh, paired with Active Directory uh, so when users are connecting in they don't have a separate set of credentials for the VPN. They can just use their Active Directory uh, username and password to connect in. So our attacker is busy sort of scanning the internet, trying to find uh, vulnerable VPN appliances, and he stumbles across across this one. Um, and the vulnerability in this case um, is a remote code execution vulnerability. Um, so even if um, you have MFA enabled on on this uh, device, even if you've got really complex password set. Uh, the attacker is able to get past those due to this, this, this particular vulnerability. So they connect in, they exploit the vulnerability, and that allows them to download a list of cached credentials in plain text from the VPN appliance. Um, so even if you're using Active Directory authentication, um, when a user connects in, the VPN caches their credentials in a text file so that if the domain controller goes down for whatever reason, the users can still connect in but they're just stored in plain text. So it's perfect for an attacker because they can just take a copy of this text file and they've got a copy of all of the credentials from, from the users who have logged into that uh, VPN frequently. Um, and then because the, the way the vulnerability works as well, they are also able to bypass MFA because they've got remote code execution on the, uh, the VPN appliance. So even if they've got multi-factor authentication enabled, it doesn't matter what type, um, the attacker would still be able to bypass that that MFA and, and get into the network. So once they've done that, they basically connect into the network. And unfortunately, what's happened is um, this organization was also allowing domain administrators to log in using the VPN. So some of the credentials that the attacker has stolen are domain admin credentials. So when they connect into the network as a legitimate user, they're connecting as a, dom as a domain admin. Um, so it's, it's a pretty bad uh, situation to be in. So in terms of breaking down the, um, the different stages of the attack and how to mitigate against them, um, so the first one is subscribe to vendor security alerts. Um, so what, what we tend to find is that most organizations have got a really good handle on installing Windows patches, but maybe not for things like VPNs. They're maybe not getting updates on when, when there's vulnerabilities in these, in these appliances. Um, making sure that you've got the these network devices included in regular patching schedules, especially if they're sitting on the perimeter of the network. So things like VPNs, um, reverse proxy servers, um, web servers, exchange, anything you've got on the perimeter of the network, you really need to be keeping an eye on the patches uh, that are coming out for those products. And then the final recommendation around uh, the vulnerable VPN is to conduct regular vulnerability scans. Um, so this is different to having a pen test done, because you would normally just have a pen test done maybe once a year or so, um, whereas vulnerability scans are scanning your network maybe every day or every week at least, um, and trying to identify any vulnerable devices on, on, the, on the perimeter of the network. Uh, the next stage of the attack, we've got the, um, the attacker downloading this list of plain text credentials. Um, so one thing we can do, which isn't going to stop the attacker from getting in, um, is to separate the authentication. Um, so don't use Active Directory to authenticate uh, your VPN. Um, so have a, have, a, have a separation there, so different username, different password for people connecting into the, into the VPN. It's not going to prevent them from getting into the VPN, but it's going to prevent them from getting domain admin access straight away. And then the final one is don't allow administrators to connect in using privileged accounts. So when you've got administrators connecting into a network, they should connect in with a normal user account first and then they should um, sort of elevate to their administrator account once they've connected in. So they shouldn't be using <coughs> domain admin accounts to connect in. And then the final bit, uh, this, is, this is probably the hardest um, bit to implement. Um, it's around monitoring. Um, so what we see when, we, when we're responding to this particular incident, we could see in the log file for the VPN um, that there were these unusual source IP addresses in there. And it also had the machine name, the remote machine name, uh, in, the, in the VPN log. So if we're able to do some monitoring on that log file, 
um, and just see sort of where people are connecting in from. And if suddenly you see IP addresses in Russia connecting into your network, then you probably want to be uh, pressing, pressing the fire button. Um, or maybe unusual client names as well. Um, so they, they might not know the naming convention of the machines on the network. So if they connect in using sort of a, a weird looking um, machine name, that might be a bit of a tip that uh, something weird is about to happen. Right, the final um, incident type we're going to look at is a compromised supplier. Um, so we've split this into two uh, sort of pieces. So we've got uh, compromised service providers on the left. Uh, so this could be if you've outsourced your IT to another company. Or you might have a third party who's got um, sort of network level access to your, to your um, organization. And then on the right hand side we've got uh, compromised software. Um, so a good example of the compromised software is the uh, NotPetya ransomware instance that happened uh, back in 2017. And that was a piece of Ukrainian software called MEDOC that was compromised. And it was um, pushed out to, uh, to, to, to companies in Ukraine. Um, and it had a malicious payload in there that basically ran ransomware on the network. And it spread quite widely um, around the world. It didn't just uh, end up sort of being in Ukraine. It was, it was, it was in quite a lot of organizations globally. Um, there's also more recent examples. Um, so there's examples, there's an incident that happened in uh, December um, with a, a component called PyTorch, um, which is a kind of machine learning uh, module, which is used by uh, machine learning, people who are developing like machine learning <coughs> software. Um, and th these things can all allow um, an attacker to get in there and uh, sort of give them initial access to the, to the network. So the, the attack we're going to look at here is the SolarWinds incident. Um, so this happened in, um, we, we believe it happened in early 2020. Um, so there's this organization called SolarWinds that produce a piece of software called SolarWinds Orion, which is a, a monitoring tool which is used by a lot of organizations globally. Um, our, our little attacker up here um, managed to gain entry into the SolarWinds network and he made a malicious modification to a DLL file that was used by the SolarWinds Orion product. Um, so it's this wonderfully named DLL, solarwinds.orion.core.businesslayer.dll. Um, so they, they modified that DLL and added some additional code into it. SolarWinds then packaged that malicious DLL up, up into what they thought was a legitimate software update, um, but it had this malicious DLL within there and it got pushed out to all of the, all the customers of SolarWinds. Um, so then we have, on the, on the bottom right hand side here, we have the, um, the, the victim, basically, and there's was, there was a lot of these victims globally, um, who installed the updates, the software update they think is legitimate. Um, and at that point, there's a malicious DLL running on their, on their SolarWinds Orion server. So it was quite a sneaky incident, this one, because the, um, the payload on the compromised server just sat there idle for about two weeks. Um, after a two-week period, um, it then connected out to this attacker-controlled DNS server and made a single DNS query to it. Um, so the, the, the domain that it's querying is this avsvmcloud.com, and the, the DLL would construct quite a long subdomain they would use as part of the query. And that subdomain had some data within it, sort of encoded within it, around like, what the victim organization was. And then if the attacker thought it was an interesting victim, um, a response would then come back, a DNS response would come back. And that response would tell the uh, SolarWinds Orion server which command and control channel, uh, command and control server to connect out to. And it establishes this uh, connection outbound using HTTP to, the, um, to the, this command and control server on the internet. So this is the most difficult type of attack to um, prevent because you've got a legitimate software update. Well, everyone, everyone thought it was legitimate, but it has this malicious DLL sort of buried within it. Uh, the DLL was actually signed as well. It was a signed DLL by SolarWinds. Um, so even if you looked at the properties of the DLL, it would still look like it was a legitimate DLL. So it's quite difficult to detect. So in terms of how you could stop this, um, there's, there's, a few, there's a few things that can happen that you can do here. Um, so the first one is don't allow your servers to communicate outbound to the internet openly. Um, this, it's quite tricky to implement this because you need to know what it, 
what, what each server does need to connect out to. So you, you want to have an allow list for each server saying, right, these are the domains and these are the IP addresses that we want it to connect out to, and then everything else should be blocked. And that would stop that connection going outbound to the command and control server. Second recommendation is run all service accounts using um, restricted accounts. Uh, so if you're, um, you've set up your SolarWinds server and um, you've been a bit lazy, you might give it uh, like a domain admin account to run under. Um, you don't want to be doing that because if it gets compromised, then the, the attacker basically has domain admin privileges. So you want to run, run these services with really sort of lockdown accounts as much as possible. Um, and then the third recommendation is implement strict network segmentation. And this is really to prevent the attacker from moving from that SolarWinds server onto other, onto other systems on the network. So if you've got um, like your crown jewels, you've got your really sensitive data, you want to be putting in um, really good network segmentation between that and everything else on the network, so that if, if something does get compromised, it's more difficult for an attacker to move onto that uh, sort of sensitive area of the, of the network. Right, so the, the attacker's done some stuff, they've got into the network, um, what are they going to do next? So probably the, the first thing they're going to want to do is establish a command and control channel. So even if they've got like the SolarWinds instance, for example, they had a command and control channel established there, but they probably want to put another one in place just to make sure that if that first one gets shut down, they're not going to get kicked off the network. Um, so we see a number of different tools being used here. Uh, the most popular one by far is Cobalt Strike. Um, so Cobalt Strike is a legitimate pen testing tool, um, and it's really good at evading like, antivirus detection. <coughs> So we see a lot of attackers using it, and that is a mix of uh, criminal attackers and also nation-state attackers. Um, they all have kind of uh, cracked versions of Cobalt Strike that they're using, um, and they'll, they'll deploy that. There's a couple of other things they might use as well, some other um, sort of uh, commercial or um, uh, freely available tools. So, uh, Puppy Rat is quite popular as well. It's a cross-platform tool, so it's available on pretty much any operating system you can think of. Um, and on the right hand side, uh, Metasploit, in particular the Meterpreter module for Metasploit, um, is quite a popular um, tool as well. They all provide similar sort of functionality. So they, they allow the attacker to have full control over whatever machine it's installed on. So they can do things like key logging, they can copy files onto the machine, they can copy files off the machine, they can execute commands, they can take screenshots if, if, it's, a, if it's like an end user machine, they can take screenshots of what's on the, what's on the screen. So it's really as if they're kind of sitting in front of that machine. Second thing they're probably going to want to do is escalate privileges. So they might have come onto the network as a normal user, um, in which case they want to try and get admin access on the machine that they're on. They might have come in as, a, as an administrator, in which case they probably want to get domain administrator privileges. Um, or they might have just come in as a domain admin straight away. So there's a few ways they can do this. Um, the first method is by exploiting a vulnerability on the machine uh, that they've landed on. Um, so this example here, the CVE, is um, a vulnerability in the Microsoft COM Plus subsystem. Um, I don't think there's any kind of working exploit for it. Um, it was patched last year. Um, but it's, it's things like this that if, a, if, an, if an attacker comes into a machine as a normal user, they can use vulnerabilities like this to elevate to system um, if it hasn't been patched. Uh, second bit in the middle um, is around um, credentials. So there could be a number of ways that they might be able to get credentials that have got higher privileges than, than they already have. So they could brute force an account. Um, if you've got a domain admin account with a really weak password set, um, they might be able to brute force it. They might be able to search across the network for files called password.txt and find all of the uh, sensitive passwords in there. Uh, there might be things like PowerShell scripts that have been uh, dotted around the network for um, admin purposes that might have hard-coded credentials within them. So if they can find those PowerShell scripts and get the credentials out of them, that's, a, that's quite a good, a good way of doing it. Um, they could, th there's a whole host of different things. There's a, there's a feature in Windows called um, Group Policy Preferences. Um, and it, it, there's these files called, uh, it, they're stored on the domain controller, but they're accessible to all users. And there's this file called gpt.inf. Um, they can search through their, those files and they sometimes have credentials stored within them as well. And then the final option on the right hand side is they can use a tool such as Mimikatz 
Um, so Mimikatz allows an attacker who's got admin access on a machine to dump um, all of the cache credentials on that machine and any uh, credentials might be stored in memory as well. So if a domain admin has logged onto that machine in the past, um, the credentials will be cached on that machine and they can dump them out of uh, out the system using Mimikatz. There's other tools as well. There's, a, um, there's quite a popular tool called Lasagna, um, which co it has all the functionality of Mimikatz and it also um, supports dumping of creds from other sort of bits of software you might have uh, on, on the machine as well. So stored credentials in the browser and um, like database admin tools, it'll dump all the creds from, from those tools. So they've, they've gone in, they've, they've got the a command and control channel established, they've elevated privileges, they've got uh, sort of domain admin access on the network now, so they can pretty much move wherever they want to move on the network. So in order to do that, um, the attacker will use tools that are already uh, in place in the organization. So if you're using RDP internally for connecting to servers um, or to end user machines, uh, they'll, they'll try and use RDP. They might download a tool like PSExec, um, which is a, a kind of a, a, a assigned Microsoft binary, and they'll use uh, these, these tools because they're less likely to get detected by any security monitoring. There's, there's other ways as well that they might move around the network, but these are the, the most common because they're quite um, difficult to detect when they're, when they're being used maliciously. So how can we stop each of these uh, sort of things from happening? So um, these uh, command and control channels, um, <clears throat> there's a few features um, in Windows Server 2016 that we can use here uh, to try and make it more difficult for those command and control channels to be established. So there's a feature in Server 2016 called DNS policies and you can configure the DNS policy to block um, particular types of DNS queries. Um, so most of the time when we're seeing DNS queries on a, on a network, we're looking at sort of A records um, or maybe C name records um, being used. They're the, the kind of dominant types of, of records. Um, the TXT records aren't used that frequently. They're used by mail servers, um, but not that much for anything else. These command and control channels um, that are being established by the attacker normally use TXT records to communicate outbound. Um, so we can use this DNS policy feature to block those uh, TXT record queries being made. Uh, we can also block known malicious IP addresses. Um, that involves knowing what the malicious IP addresses are, but there's a number of services you can subscribe to um, that will give you lists of IP addresses and domain names that are malicious. Um, and you can, you can basically block those, uh, the, the, those uh, IP addresses and domain names on your network and just prevent those connections from being established. Um, the uh, sort of privileged escalation side of things. So the first one around, um, we've got this vulnerability here. Um, so making sure that you've got security patches applied quickly. Um, so Microsoft Patch Tuesday um, is kind of ingrained in everyone's heads, I think. Um, but just making sure that the patches are being pushed out and you're also checking to make sure the patches have been installed properly um, is a good thing to do. Uh, control privileged accounts. So don't allow people to use domain admin accounts um, at, at all really. Um, they shouldn't really be using domain admin accounts for anything. It should be kind of something that's locked up in a safe. Um, making sure that you've got strong passwords set on those privileged accounts. Um, maybe just enabling the privileged accounts when you need them and keeping them locked the rest of the time. And then the final recommendation at the bottom, um, this is to uh, sort of make it more difficult for attackers to dump creds from memory. Um, there's a feature in Windows 10 called Credential Guard, which is turned off by default, unfortunately. Um, what this does is it virtualizes the LSAS process on the machine, um, and it prevents um, an, an attacker who's running code uh, in user mode from getting into that process and dumping the, the, the credentials uh, from it. It's, a, it's something that can be enabled using group policy. Um, it just needs a machine with a, a TPM chip in it. Um, so it's, it, like all modern machines have got TPM chips in. Um, so it's quite an easy one to just turn on and not worry about. And then the final bit about lateral movement. Um, so uh, what, what can you do here? So looking at features that we've got on the network already, this, this one gets one and a half uh, bolt cutters. Um, it's kind of in between one and two, I think. Um, so you can use uh, firewalls on the network to prevent the attacker from moving laterally. Um, a really good thing to do is to use the host-based firewall, like the Windows firewall that comes built into Windows for doing this. 
Um, you can do that to lock down ports that shouldn't be accessible. So exam uh, for an example, on your end user machines, you don't need any SMB traffic coming into your end user machines. You don't need any RDP traffic coming into the, into the end user machines. These are protocols that can all be used by an attacker to move around the network. So if you're blocking those ports and preventing, the, uh, preventing access to them, um, it's quite a good, good little feature to turn on there. Um, you can monitor unusual traffic between hosts. This one gets uh, uh, three bolt cutters for this one. Um, it's quite difficult to do. Um, you need good sort of network level monitoring in place here to see, uh, and you need to know what normal looks like on your network as well, and so you can detect uh, sort of anomalous activity. Um, so it's quite a difficult one to implement. And then the bottom one, we've sort of touched on this one before, but implementing AppLocker or Defender Application Guard um, is a really good thing to do, and that will prevent um, a lot of attacker tools, well, any attacker tools from running on, on the end user machines in any case, in the first place.